number of weeks ago, we began a series called The Spirit-Filled Life. You know, all of us are full of something, right? You lean over that person by you and say, you're full of it. Amen. We're full of something, all of us. Now, the world wants to fill us up with bad stuff, okay? But the Lord wants to fill us up with the awesome life transformational power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, you find out whatever you're full of when you're squeezed, okay? Or when you're under pressure. When you're under pressure and you're squeezed, whatever's inside is going to come out. Have you ever had something kind of nasty come out, you know? You know, maybe you said something that was ugly and you thought, where in the world did that come from? Guess where it came from? It came from you. <laughs> All right? I was talking about that in our leadership class today. Sometimes we got to get the junk out of the trunk, man. Sometimes there's some stuff that can attach itself to our spirit living in this, this world. You know, when we get saved, we don't get put in a magic protective bubble you know, we don't live in the sweet by and by. We live in the nasty here and now. Amen? And so sometimes there's some stuff that can crawl up inside us that if we don't take out the trash every now and then and fill it up with stuff that we're supposed to have, then what's, when we're squeezed, whatever comes out is not going to be good. And God wants us to be a witness. Amen? He wants us to be a blessing. The Bible says, out of the overflow or the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. And so God had baptized these individuals with the awesome power of His Holy Spirit. But they were in a squeezing time right now, okay? They were being squeezed by some powerful people. You know, sometimes people are a source of great joy. And sometimes they're just a pain in the backside, right? Come on. Now, I know that's not real spiritual, but it's the truth, right? Come on, you know? And so, an amazing miracle had happened. God had supernaturally filled them with the power of the Holy Spirit. And they had taken the supernatural power that had been given to them as the church outside the church, and a powerful healing miracle took place in a guy's life, and an undeniable, irrefutable witness had been established. You see, God wants to use you and I to do His stuff. Isn't that great? And He wants to empower us and fill us with the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to do irrefutable and undeniable stuff. But I want you to know, even though it was an exciting time, it was also a dangerous time because they had caught the attention of some dangerous people. The same people who were behind the opposition and the crucifixion of, the Jesus, of Jesus set their sights on these guys. Because you see, when God is blessing, the devil will start messing. How many of you know that's true? Because you see, when we're full of the Holy Spirit and we truly start acting like the church, we become dangerous to the devil and his plans. Amen. Jesus said, I'm going to build a church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Amen. 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 Now the Scripture says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, that the reason that Jesus came was to destroy the works of the devil. Isn't that great? Amen. And the Lord wants you and I to be enforcers of that destructive um, work that Jesus did on the cross. Amen. He wants to use us to enforce and carry out His work. Now, one of the crucial keys that He gives to us, remember He said, I'm going to build a church that the gates of hell can't prevail against, and I'm going to give you keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, one of those really important keys is Spirit-filled praying. Okay? God wants to use you and I to Pray prayers that affect the destiny and the eternity of people, okay? He doesn't want us to pray little prayers. He wants us to pray big, amazing, earth-shaking prayers. D.L. Moody, one of the great evangelists of America, said behind every great work of God, you will always find someone praying. In, in our country, one of the great revivals that happened happened in the 
early 18 to mid 1800s and it was called the Second Great Awakening. And one of the key figures for the Second Great Awakening was Charles Finney. And Charles Finney was a powerful, powerful evangelist. Literally, there was such an anointing of the Spirit on his life that when he took the train into certain communities, the whole community would fall under conviction. That's not bad, amen? That's power with God. God wants to empower us in that way. But Charles Finney had a silent partner and his name was Father Nash. He was an older gentleman. And Father Nash, the strategy was, a couple of weeks before Charles would come to hold revival meetings in a particular area, before that, Father Nash would go into that town and absolutely blanket that town with intercession and spiritual warfare and prayer. And so Charles Finney did not attribute the great moves of God to the power of his preaching, but to the power of Father Nash's intercession. Why? Because before God ever does something great, He always starts people praying. Amen? And so God wants you and I to be people who pray prayers that shake places up. Amen. And that's what happened in this particular case. In Ephesians chapter number 4, verse 23, it says this, On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said. Remember, they threatened them, and they told them to stop doing what they were doing. When they heard this, these threats, this bad news, this tough situation, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, You made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it. And then they proceeded to pray more, and you can read that on your own. But verse number 31 says this, after they prayed. Say that with me. After they prayed. Listen, if you want something to get going and get moving, if you have a situation in your life, you need to pray. And it says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. Okay? Now as we see this, we see some keys to praying Spirit-filled prayers. I'm not talking about just kind of a wish list prayers. I'm talking about praying from a reservoir of the power of the Holy Spirit that God has inculcated into your life when you came to Him and when He filled you with His Spirit. And there are four keys I want you to see to praying Spirit-filled prayers. The first thing I want you to see is this. When you feel like panicking, and you will, Because I want to tell you this, being a Christian does not exempt you from difficulty. Being a Christian does not exempt you from danger. Being a Christian does not exempt you from threatening circumstances. And your natural human tendency would be to panic, would be to worry, would be to stress out. It would be to be in anxiety. But when you feel like panicking, pray instead. Amen. Amen. Fact is, your anxiety, your worry, your kind of tension is a sign that it's time to pray. Amen. Not panic. Remember their context. It was both an exciting and a dangerous time for them. There was much spiritual um, electricity in their environment. It was ripe for miraculous moves of God and kingdom advancement, but also they had captured the attention of the powerful and dangerous guys behind the opposition and the crucifixion of Jesus. 
Chapter 4, verse 18 says, they were ordered by these guys. These guys were in religious authority. They were in civil authority. They were big somebodies, so to speak. And they were ordered by these guys to stop doing what they were doing in the name of Jesus. Not only were they ordered not to do what they did in the name of Jesus, but verse 21 says they were threatened by these guys. Now remember, these were the guys behind the violence perpetrated against Jesus. Okay? And Jesus had told us in His Word, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have pressure. You're going to find yourself in dangerous situations. You see, life is 10% what happens to you. And oftentimes, it will happen to you when you walk into a doctor's office. Come on. How many of you know what I'm talking about? The older you get, the more nervous you are when you walk into the doctor's office. The doctor's office is a very threat. Hey, listen, I love you doctors. You all are fabulous. You're incredible. I love you. I love that, little, that one right there, Poland. Okay, you know what he told me one time? I kept calling him, hey, doc, hey, doctor, hey, doc. And he said, listen, if you keep calling me that, I'm going to have to charge you. <laughs> That's right, because your name was Poland first, right? And I love doctors, but man, they make me nervous, you know? Because look, I can look in the mirror and see I'm not healthy. Come on! It's a threatening place to go to. And the first thing that threatens you, or threatens me anyway, is what you have to do before you ever see them. And that is what? Step on the scale. scale. So you know what I do? I take off everything I possibly could take off. (laughs) Shoes, keys, wallet, Cell phone, you know, you hear what I'm saying? How many of you know what I'm saying? (laughs) And they're brilliant people, but sometimes you can walk in there thinking everything is okay. Hello? And you can get a diagnosis that can threaten your life. Okay? It can happen in our finances. It can happen in our relationships. It can happen with our children. We can raise our children in a trajectory to serve the Lord. We can raise them in church, in Sunday school, in youth group, on missions trips. And they can make their own decisions that can devastate your life. This world is full of threatening things, okay? Dangerous things. So life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to what happens to you. Now, as Spirit-filled people, rather than panic, we pray. It is how we deal with difficulty. It is not our last resort. It's our first response. When we don't know what to do, man, we know where to go. Amen? And so it says this in verse 23 and 24. On their release from just having been threatened by these guys... Peter and John went back to their own people and repeated everything that the chief priests and elders had said to them when they heard this. All of the threats, all of the bad news, all of the danger that had been spit out, they raised their voices together in prayer. Why? Because Spirit-filled people don't panic, they pray. Now we feel like panicking, come on! This is the way Paul put it in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything. One translation says, don't worry about anything. How many of you know that's easier said than done? Especially when you have children. I say, if you want to increase your prayer life, have children. Amen. Did you know the word worry is taken from the German word worgen, which means to strangle mentally? You see, when we worry, it's not profitable, man. We're not thinking real intelligently when we worry. And so Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. Say that with me. In everything. What does that mean? It means in everything. Okay, in everything, whatever happens. No matter how bad, no matter how good, no matter how simple, no matter how complicated, but in everything by prayer. 
You see, it's how we do life as believers. It's not just words we say. It's a life and a posture that we live by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your request to the Lord. And what will happen? The peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't that something? And so there have been many things that have happened to me that I have thought, I don't see this working out very well. You hear what I'm saying? This is a lose-lose situation. But nothing is impossible with God. Amen. He has a peace that transcends my circumstance. My circumstance naturally will make me worry and anxious and fearful and panic. But if we are spirit-filled, born again, people of faith, when these situations come and they will, we pray instead of panic. Amen. Amen. The second thing I want you to see is this spirit-filled praying focuses on God's sovereignty, not our circumstance. And that is really important. Because let's just be honest, sometimes our prayers are just complaining. Amen? Sometimes they're not real faith-filled. And so in verse 24 it says, When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God, and they said, Sovereign Lord. Now the word sovereign in the Greek means having supreme rank, power, and authority to be preeminent and above everything. Never forget that whatever is over your head is still under His feet. He is a sovereign Lord. He said, you have made everything. You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in it. We need to never forget, He is who He is irrespective of my circumstance. The status of my circumstance or the status of His sovereignty is in no way affected or altered or diminished by the severity of my circumstance. Stuff happens to us, but He is immutable, which means He is not changed by my circumstance. And so when I go to the Lord in prayer, I can come from two perspectives. I can come from a problem perspective, which blows up the power of the problem, or I can come from a sovereignty perspective which says it may be big and it may be dangerous and it may be bigger than me, but it's not bigger than God. Amen. Amen. Nothing is bigger than God. Amen. That is the perspective that David had when he approached his fight against Goliath. He didn't ignore what Goliath had. He didn't ignore that he was a dangerous foe. He said this. He said, hey pal, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and a javelin. In other words, you can kill me three ways. And I know it. But I come to you in the name of the Lord God of hosts. Amen. And host means armies. Amen. How many of you know God's got some armies? Come on. And they're angel armies. And angels aren't some little cherub that floats around with some little bow and arrow. They are bad mamma jammas. Amen. Come on. And Psalm 91 says, He will command His angels concerning you. Hebrews 1 says, Angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who are the heirs of salvation. Amen. So we don't ignore our circumstance, but we acknowledge His sovereignty. Amen. God made everything. Come on. He made everything. 
Because He is sovereign, nothing is impossible with Him. In fact, our impossibilities are His opportunities. He eats impossibility for breakfast like Wheaties. Come on. He loves impossible situations. Fact is, His strength, the Scripture says, is made perfect. That means displayed most fully in my weakness. You see, if I can, then I need to. But if I can't, no matter how smart or how resourced or whatever else, then i got to turn to Him. And He can turn my can't into a can because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen! And Spirit-filled praying doesn't ignore the circumstance. It acknowledges the sovereignty of God. Amen. That's why it's always best to start your prayers with praise. Amen. Come on. Enter His gates with thanksgiving. Come on. Come on. How many of you, you, you know, those of you that had kids, how many of you it used to bug you when they came like this? You, how many of you know what I'm saying? Come on. Help me, somebody. If they're too young, they will. And like this gets more and more and they ask for more and more. They used to want a toy and then later on they'll want a car. Hello. But man, when they come like this, hello. You know, I got this picture of my son Jeffrey. He's my six foot four skinny kid. But when he was little, there's this picture of him just looking up at me like, Dad is awesome. It's one of my favorite pictures in the world. But then he went to junior high school. And, and, and he didn't really care for the car I was driving because it, it was homegrown ugly. And so he said, Dad, keep driving, I'll jump out. <laughs> and I was like, could it be that he is ashamed of his dad? That used to be awesome. And see, when we come like this, when we come, we enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Certainly it it softens His heart, but He loves us anyway. But it also changes our perspective. Amen? Because we see one who has come through before and will come through again. Amen? Amen. Amen. The third thing I want you to see is this, Spirit-filled praying. Throw your threats on God. There's lots of things that can threaten us, especially in this world. It's a dangerous world we live in. And it's a very dangerous time that we're living in even now. The last days are very dangerous. Paul would call them perilous times would come. You see, Spirit-filled people don't ignore and deny threatening circumstances but they acknowledge it before the sovereign and almighty God. Okay? And, and so it says this in verse 29, Now, Lord, consider their threats. Consider their threats. The word threat there, apella, in the Greek means that which is close and menacing, an imminent peril or danger. It is something that is too close and too dangerous to ignore. It is the picture of a constant menacing predator. Okay? Something that has ill intent toward you. Okay? And we live in a world like that. This is what Peter said. He said this in 1 Peter 5.8, Our enemy, the devil, prowls around as a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's menacing, okay? So what do we do? Do we deny His reality? No, He's real, okay? But, but in 1 Peter 5, 7, which is the verse before 1 Peter 5, 8, Peter tells us what to do when we have menacing circumstances. And it says this, we cast our cares... Upon Him, why? 
Because He cares for us. The word cast in the Greek means to throw over on. Or when you're holding something so heavy and you can't even throw it just to roll it over on. Okay? Too many times we're trying to carry cares that are too heavy for us. And so what Peter says is, he says, cast your cares on Him. Why? Because He cares for us. The word cares there in the Greek means to be concerned with, to matter to. So whatever is causing me care, whatever is causing me anxiety, whatever is threatening me because He loves me, because He cares about me, I don't have to try to carry it around and it bring me down, but I can throw it over on Him and I can roll it over on Him. Why? Because He cares for me. Isn't that great? He cares. Isn't that awesome? Nudge that person by you and say, He cares. Isn't that awesome? You see, when you know somebody cares about you, you go to them quicker, don't you? Come on, let's just be honest. Some people, when you're having a hard time, you don't share that information with, right? Why? Because they don't really care. That wouldn't be anybody in here, by the way. But when you found somebody who really cares about you, you hear what I'm saying? They really take a special interest. You know, when, when you're sharing this, they're not looking around. They're looking at you. You know? That is who we approach. The Scripture says this. We do not have a high priest who is unable to be touched by the feeling of our weakness. But He was in all points tested like we were yet without sin. So therefore, understanding this, that He understands and He cares about us, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen? Come on. To obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So there are going to be some threatening things that are going to come against us in our life. But we need to throw our threats on the One who cares for us. Amen? You still with me? How many of you still here? Amen. Amen. And the fourth thing is this. Pray for further spiritual empowerment. Okay? I think it's interesting... that they didn't ask God to take them out of their circumstance. Okay? But to supernaturally empower them in and for their circumstance. You see, when you see your life as being in God's hands, and God filling you with His Spirit and His power, you come to understand that even on the worst days, God can turn it around for our good. And rather than that thing wrecking us, He wants to put us in a position where He can give Him greater glory. And so when we see things from that perspective, that's the perspective that Joseph had with his brothers when he had come through this situation and seen God connect all of the dots. And he said this, You intended it for my harm, but God turned it for good. Amen! Amen! And so God has a purpose in our pain. And God never wastes a circumstance, even the most devastating. But you heard me say last week, He will turn our greatest misery into our greatest ministry if we let Him do a work in us. And so they did not pray to be delivered from the circumstance, but to be empowered in it. The word enable here, he says, they prayed, enable your servants. Didymi in the Greek means bring and connect power to, to supernaturally empower. And this is what they asked. They asked for God to empower them to do th- two things. First of all, to speak the word boldly. Come on, folks. To speak the word boldly. He says, enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. And secondly, to be conduits for the miraculous. Did you know God wants to use you and I? 
to accomplish miraculous things, that He doesn't give us the power of His Holy Spirit to give us a quiver in our liver and a jet in our strut, but He gives the power of His Spirit to make us powerful witnesses. And so they said, enable your servants to speak the word with great boldness. And verse 30 says, stretch out your hand through us to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. This is God, what God wants us to do and be. His hands extended. Amen. Come on. Powerful witnesses and conduits of healing and the miraculous. Okay? All right, so you still with me? So Spirit-filled praying. Praise instead of panics. It focuses on God's sovereignty, not our circumstance. It doesn't ignore threats, but casts cares on Him who cares. And ask God to empower for whatever the challenge might be, okay? Now, what was the results to their Spirit-filled praying? And, and, and remember this. If we do things in a Spirit-filled way, we can expect Spirit-filled results which are immeasurably more than we could dare to ask for or even imagine. So what happened as a result of their prayers? First of all, things started moving and shaking. Okay? If you want to get stuff moving, start praying. Come on. You got something that needs to move in your life? Some believers need a movement. Amen? If you need something moving, start praying. Now you better be careful because it'll start moving in epic proportions. It says this in verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. Okay? The word shaken is the Greek word seismos, which is what, where we get the word seismic, you know, which measures earthquakes, okay? It means a holy commotion. It means to rock and quake. Okay, that's how come when God pours out His Holy Spirit, you better not try to control it. Amen. Hello, come on. Because it's like touching an electric wire. You're going to rock and shake. Amen. Amen. It's like inviting Him to come into the building. Malachi said this, The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into His temple, and who can stand when He appears? You know, we, we like to think, well, if Jesus walked in here, man, we'd just be, oh, cool, what's happening, Jesus? It's good to see you. No, if He walked in here, we'd go. <laughs> Come on. So, so lean over that person and say, you better be careful. Come on. Come on, because remember, He's sovereign, we're not. If you ask Him to do stuff, you can't tell Him how to do it. Hello? Come on, somebody. How many of you love to tell Him how to do it? Come on. See, we call that praying, don't we? Oh, God, listen now. Listen now. Oh, come here. Come here, God. <laughs> and it's, it's said, if you want to make God laugh, tell Him your plans. They had said, oh, sovereign Lord. So you know what they were doing? They were inviting Him to be in charge. And see, listen now. When you invite Him to be in charge, you better watch out, Jack. Because He's going to rock your world. Amen? But it's okay. All right? Because when He rocks it, it's going to be all right. It's not going to pull it apart. It's going to bring things together. Amen. Amen. You still with me? The second thing is really important, especially for people that have been in Pentecostal churches for a while. Because somehow we think a little dab will do you. A little dose of the Holy Ghost. And, and I want to tell you, we don't need just a little dose. But number two, they were refilled with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
How many of you know sometimes we need to be refilled? Amen. Come on. Periodically, we need to get a refilling of our spiritual gas tank. If we're going to participate in amazing things that God has planned for us, we got to get refilled. Amen. Hey, listen, you can have the most incredible car imaginable. Somebody throw out a car that you'd love to drive. Come on, somebody tell me. Oh, a Tesla? Go ahead. A Lotus. A Bugatti? You better not say that three times. We're in a Pentecostal church. <laughs> Something else. Lamborghini. Corvette. What's that? An Audi R8. You know, my next car, I, I, I would like it to be a truck. Can you imagine that? With the cab, I'm not talking about a truck. I'm talking about a truck. And, of course, Kim has assured me, well, you go ahead and enjoy that because I'm not riding with you. <laughs> you can have the greatest car imaginable, okay? But if you don't put gas in that car, you're going to be walking. Amen. Isn't that true? Come on. And some of y'all are fine. You're fine. Ooh, you are fine. You are handsome. Come on. You're tens. Come on. But when we go through exacting circumstances, both good or bad, we need to get filled back up. Because there are areas of our life that get depleted, right? When we're in difficult, they just come through an incredibly exhilarating experience. But they'd also come through a very dangerous experience. And so they knew that their spiritual tank was low. And so what did they ask? They asked God to fill them back up. And so it says this. It says, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now wait a second. They were already filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. If they were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 and by Acts 4 they needed to be filled again, maybe it's more than a one-time thing. Come on! In Ephesians 5.18, Paul said, be filled with the Spirit. The Greek literally means in that be being filled with the Spirit. Why? Because we leak. And because they're exacting and debilitating circumstances that come into our life that empty certain areas of our life. And so if we're going to be the people God calls us to be, it's not by might nor by power. It's by a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God doesn't want us to walk around or walk out of these experiences depleted, but filled in greater measure than previously experienced with the awesome, life-giving, transformational power of the Holy Spirit. The word filled here that they pray, play through, means to increase the level of it, means to furnish a full supply. It's to take the car of your life to the gas station. Come on. Amen. The third thing that happened was they declared God's Word with new boldness. You see, when you get a fresh feeling, you get a new boldness. So it says, and they spoke the Word of God boldly. You see, that's what we're called to be is bold. Come on. It's part of who we are as believers. The Scripture says the righteous, who are those? They to get it right. Those that are in right relationship with God. The righteous are bold as a lion. This is what Paul asked for when he requested prayer of the Ephesians. In Ephesians 6, 19 and 20. He said, pray for me. How many of you know spiritual leaders need our prayers? Amen. Amen. I absolutely request your prayers because I regularly come against things that, that are bigger than me, that I, I don't feel equipped necessarily to handle. So I say, pray for me. Pray for me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change. Remember, Paul is writing this from prison. 
Okay, a very debilitating place. He says, man, pray for me that I may speak the word of God fearlessly. He says, pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. As I should. Amen. You see, we're supposed to be bold. Amen. Not in our strength. Not in our intelligence. But by His Spirit. Now, He'll use your strength. He'll use your gifting. He'll use your intelligence. But when you couple it with God's power of His Holy Spirit, it's the wherewith to compare with, man. Amen. The final thing is this. The supernatural power of God increased among them. And that's what God wants. He doesn't want less of His power. He wants more of His power among us. Amen? You see, they were growing into their God-ordained calling to spread the gospel and be the church that Jesus said the gates of hell could not prevail against. So verse 33, listen to this, it says this. With great power, the apostles continued to testify of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was powerfully at work within them. Isn't that great? That's awesome. That's what God wants to do with us. Amen? We believe in the Spirit's infilling. We believe it wasn't just for then, but it's for today. If they needed it to get the church started, we need it to finish up the plan. Amen? Amen. We need it every single day. Because every day we're faced by threatening circumstances. Every day we have an adversary that prowls around looking for someone to devour. Now, thank the Lord, we have a source we can go to that, that is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And, and I say Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a little brother. Any of y'all ever had a little brother? It seemed like you couldn't get rid of them. You know what I'm saying? They were where you didn't want them to be. You know how I know that? Because I was a little brother. I had a big sister, and she used to try to lose me all the time. Come on. She'd get a boyfriend. Come on. I'd get to know him. (laughs) Do you love my sister? I just went on a first date with her. Do you love her? You know, and I drive my sister crazy. Did you know one time my sister told me I was demon possessed? (laughs) I might have been. The Lord is a friend that sticks closer than even a little brother. You can't get away from him. Come on. David said, if I make my bed in hell, he's going to be right down there with me. He did not create you to fail. Come on. He didn't build His home in you to move away. Come on. He didn't teach you to swim to let you drown. Come on. He purchased you with His precious blood. He's got an investment in us. He has given us the life-giving supernatural power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be His witnesses. Amen? Amen.